So a few of these next questions are actually from our audience. We hosted a CME certified webinar uh, about a week ago, and we were talking about what clinicians can expect from if they have COVID-19 patients. And we were able to answer a lot of those questions uh, from our panelists during that. We had you know, our editor-in-chief, uh, Jason Gallagher. We had Carlos Del Rio. We had a few other very intelligent panelists as well, uh, but we didn't get to everything. And so we wanted to draw on the, the Q&A that we got there to generate interview questions and at least get some of those audience questions answered down the line. So a few of these next ones are, are, are gonna be from there, which I, I feel pretty excited about, I guess, to get, to get that from our audience. But the first one would be, we know that a certain amount of viral shedding occurs after patients have left the hospital. There's different debates coming out about how long people should be quarantined after. What might be the right standard for recovery? And where does the evidence point at the moment in terms of whether this viral shedding is actually infectious after people have recovered? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and listen, I, I'll always put out the caveat that, that listen, I'm, I'm just a simple virologist. I'm not a clinician. So, uh, you know, my, my viewpoints are maybe a little bit different from, uh, from, from what uh, clinicians would see with, with their patients or have. Um, but some of the data that comes out right now uh, or has been coming out recently has suggested that, um, at least in terms of the uh, infectious virus, uh, what has been seen is that shedding seems to occur um, somewhere for around a week, uh, give or take a few days on either side, uh, once a patient becomes symptomatic. Um, and, and that's kind of what, what is being viewed at least as being somewhat of the standard. Now, the problem is, is that ultimately, I don't think we're far enough um, into this pandemic with enough clinical data yet to say uh, definitively, how long can a person shed for? And, and it comes back to the, the basically the question that you or that you just raised in regards to infectious uh, virus versus viral um, components, which I kind of look at as, you know, as like a, a pinata. So if you go into, uh, you know, go to a party and somebody has a pinata, um, you can identify that that's pinata. Um, if somebody breaks it apart with a hammer uh, or, or a bat uh, and somebody comes into the yard an hour later, they can kind of piece together that that was once a pinata based on, on what was there, um, just based on the, the pieces that are lying on the ground. But you can't kind of reform that whole pinata. That's kind of the same thing with, with what we're looking at right now with all this uh, RNA data is that it's suggested that the virus was once there, but it doesn't tell us that there is still a whole virus there. Um, and the limitation has really been trying to uh, establish assays to tell us what is that correlation between uh, the amount of RNA that we see versus an infectious virus. Um, so I, I think that you know, quite a few of, of the comments I've seen have been for people that recover, so uh, you know, once they're released from a hospital or once they're deemed as being recovered and, and they're in the convalescent stage, um, that they still self-isolate for 14 days just to, again, minimize uh, any potential shedding uh, that may be seen, uh, whether it's from respiratory secretions or any other biological fluids. So in, in our webinar, the panel also examined one of the clinical cases that we brought up was uh, COVID-19, where there was a simultaneous adenovirus infection. And then there's been some reports that you're seeing a lot of co-infections. Um, sure. Is it possible for someone to have both influenza and COVID-19, for example? Yeah, so some of the data out of China actually suggests that that, that definitely uh, is a possibility. Um, what we don't really understand yet is what is the relationship um, be between essentially that co-infection versus uh, either virus on their own in terms of disease severity. So, uh, you know, does having a simultaneous influenza infection or uh, an underlying uh, additional viral infection, does that preclude you from more severe disease? Um, I don't think the data is conclusive yet on that. Um, what we do know, though, is that patients that, um, that tend to show more severe signs of uh, COVID-19 may actually have bacterial co-infections, which is fairly common uh, in severe patients with uh, influenza as well as RSV. Um, and we know for certain that basically bacteria will exacerbate disease in those cases. So I think we can make some uh, general assumptions based on what we've seen from other viruses. Uh, but, but I think the phenomenon of co-infection, it's going to take a while to gain a piece through the data and look at the outcomes of those patients to really get a feeling of whether or not there, there was any kind of synergistic activity. So um, 
Do we have any past examples? I know we haven't ever had a coronavirus become a global pandemic on this scale before, but coronavirus is becoming um, more minor seasonal burdens in certain regions or something like that. Um, yeah. So that, see, something fan- Go ahead. Do you see uh, COVID becoming a seasonal burden as a possibility or likelihood here? Because I know we're at least looking at the possibility of even in the uncertain case that things die down in the summer with warmer weather somewhat, which is an uncertainty, that we see another surge smaller and maybe something we're more prepared for in the fall. Yeah, so another fantastic question, right? And you know, some of this came out of um, really what was seen during the original uh, SARS epidemic, uh, because there was uh, you know a small cluster of cases that emerged in twenty uh, sorry two thousand four, um, and there was some fear at that time that it may indicate that the virus had started to become seasonal. Um, though obviously the the virus ended up disappearing, and, and that you know very thankfully didn't happen. Um, we do know with prior coronaviruses that uh, that they you know have been endemic in the population. There are four coronaviruses uh, outside of SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2 uh, that have been circulating since you know I think it's estimated around the 1960s and caused largely cold-like symptoms in in most patients. Um, those ones did exhibit some signs of seasonality, um, but the question is you know what what is the driving force behind that? Is it Temperature and humidity, uh, because it's a little bit lower, uh, you know, lower temperature in the wintertime, a little bit lower humidity. Uh, is it the proximity of people to one another? What are the driving forces behind that? And I don't think we're quite there with understanding with, um, with SARS-CoV-2 whether that will be the case. Um, I think, again, you know, I know a lot of people have talked about this, this potential for the virus to become endemic um, if it was to, to continue to, uh, to spread kind of unmitigated or, um, you know, without being impeded by our containment procedures, I, I don't think we know yet. And uh, realistically, our biggest concern right now, you know, let's get physical distancing done. It's painful. Um, I sympathize with people completely. Um, but if we can try and actually curb transmission, we may end up in a situation like we were with the original SARS epidemic, where ultimately maybe this virus will disappear. Um, but let's do everything we can to, to try and, and, and mitigate uh, uh, spread and, and concerns about it becoming endemic. So there were these earlier reports about there being two different types. Uh, some media reports were calling it strains in headlines. Some were calling it different types called L and S type. Do you know if that's still considered correct or anything else about the potential mutation and variability of this virus? I mean, I know um actually the the mutation in viruses the the kind of popular fear would be that it gets more deadly but it tends mm-hmm. to go in the other direction right right and, and so the the data uh, i think is still pretty preliminary um what we've seen is that there's basically like you said there's the l and s forms or or strains as some people have called them um l seems to be the one that's uh found predominantly within the population i think it's like 70% versus 30% for s although s seems to be the ancestral form um, and, and there was some, I, there was a little bit of discussion as to whether or not uh, L may have actually been, um, you know, the the form that that was seen earlier and was more aggressive, and that S maybe was a little bit less aggressive uh, in uh, in terms of its transmission and its virulence. Um, the problem is, is that we don't know, right? So a lot of this has been uh, again um, hypothesized based out of sequencing data. So the problem is, um, you know, realistically, do we have any biological data to, to back that up, either in patients or in, in cell culture or animal models? Um, again, we're, we're not quite there yet. Uh, and I think we'll, you know, we will definitely be able to, to look at that uh, at, at this over time. People did this with, with MERS, definitely between the EMC and Jordan strains, uh, you know, early in, in, in 2013, 2014. Um, it, it's going to take some time. But uh, for right now, you know, I think that the strategy still remains the same of we need to get it contained uh, and, uh, and at the same time try and actually get labs around the world to be able to, to look at, at these potential differences. So um, what can you tell me about the possible evolution of the virus? Because there was honestly what seemed like a bit of fake news about the virus coming out, being bioengineered from a lab in Wuhan. I mean, I guess the less... The less conspiratorial, though still not totally substantiated version of that is that it was of natural origin and then, you know, precautions weren't taken enough. But the, the, the 
consensus or the emerging consensus seems to be no, it, it, it came out of nature and then we had these animal markets involved. What's the evidence that this is a virus out of nature? Yeah, so you know, I think again, we we've relied so heavily on uh, people that are doing whole viral uh, genome sequencing uh, during uh, this pandemic to try and give us some inferences on what this virus is and and where it came from and what it's going to do. Um, you know, we we all have seen the um, you know the stories about what what this virus is and where it came from. Uh, in particular, whether again this was bioengineered or not. Um, the right now the sequencing data simply does not provide any evidence whatsoever that this was a bioengineered virus. And, and essentially what they've been able to do is look at the sequences um, to essentially look to see uh, whether there were imperfections within the sequences that would suggest that, um, that this was basically done through uh, you know, cloning procedures or, or bioengineering procedures. And there simply is no evidence of that. Um, everything uh, you know, definitely points to the fact that this was something that naturally spilled over. And, and again, this, this would not be that surprising because we've We've seen this with its closest relative, with SARS. Uh, we've seen this with MERS, even though MERS was circulating in, in camels for you know for decades, or likely decades prior to emerging in humans. Um, so what you know again, I I appreciate that a lot of people um, maybe look at this as being you know how can you how, how can there be these you know really low chance events that lead to something like a pandemic? And the unfortunate side is this is how emerging viruses behave. Um, if we go back to thinking about you know how they circulate. Uh, you know, we, we talk about the fact that, you know, this virus likely emerged from bats. Um, well, first of all, we know that they're, you know, bats are, uh, you know, one of the most populous mammalian species that there is, one of the most diverse species. Um, so now we have to basically say out of all the millions and billions of bats, now there are likely, a, you know, small subsections of uh, specific, um, you know, uh, types of bats that are carrying this virus. But by the way, it's not that every animal within that particular species of bat is carrying the virus. It's likely a tiny subset that is actually carrying the virus at any one point in time. And that's where it becomes this, this chance event that you essentially have that one bat that at the right time happens to you know, pass on biological fluid to another animal that, that again can carry the virus. And, and that's what happens. So you know, I think it's, it comes back to our job as, as scientists to try and communicate that better with, with what we understand about spillover events. Um, but also providing more evidence and more context uh, when we uh, do things like you know whole genome sequencing uh, to you know for the public to understand what that data actually means and what what it uh, what the context is and what it implies.